Welcome to Rethink You, bringing you ideas, inspiration, and motivation to start living the life you were created to live. Here is your host, author, trainer, speaker, and coach, and founder of Rethink You, Kim Levins. Well, welcome back to the We Think You podcast. I'm excited that this month of August of 2021, our theme is Follow Your Dream. And as I began searching for guests to interview, I was inundated with with opportunities. So I'm excited to bring you our first guest of the month, who is Aga, who is Polish. And Aga is a mom of two school-age girls and a stepmom of two college boys. She quit her oil and gas industry-related consulting career to go back to school and support moms. She is a researcher at heart. And in her coaching practice, she marries a no-bullshit approach with mindfulness and compassion. After becoming a mother and discovering that nothing about motherhood went as predicted, Aga dedicated years to do her personal healing and realized that empowering moms and creating community are her passions. She designs group coaching programs to deconstruct the common image of motherhood promoted by our culture and to help women find ease and get grounded in their feminine power. Wow, Aga, that is just an incredible story. I can't wait for the conversation, but why don't we kick it off first of all by welcoming you to the podcast and then saying, give us your last name because we decided that you would say it for yourself. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Kim, for having me here in your show. I am honored. And my last name, people, is Lavrinovich. Lavrinovich. You know, when she says that, I get it right. <laughs> you got it absolutely right. This is rare, Kim. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Aga. And why don't we start by, you know, I'm fascinated to listen to this because I'm a grandmother and I know my daughter is going to love your conversation because reading this bio, I was excited to share it with you, her, because she is also saying motherhood is nothing that she expected it to be. And tell us a bit of your story and how did you end up doing what you're doing now? Wow, <laughs> this is a long story, so I'm going to try Fine. to condense it. So I grew up in Poland, and throughout my childhood, Poland was used to be a communist country. So I grew up in a totally different world than I raised my children in right now. So um, everything was different, and my family, um, so my I'm the first person in my family who pursued a college degree. Um, And what motivated me to do it is observing my grandmas and my mom and seeing how amazing, hardworking and industrious they were and yet so disempowered by the culture. So I kind of felt that I have to do it differently. And my plan was the pursuing education, getting a job that would pay me some money that I can decide about (laughs) would bring me to a different place. And it did because I've experienced many amazing adventures. Uh, I used to work in the oil and gas industry for over 10 years, started on all the rigs, traveled a lot, lived in many countries, worked with amazing international colleagues. And then I met my husband. (laughs) We fell in love and we decided to have a family. And this was the pivotal moment for me because when I became a mom, suddenly, you know, I thought I was so smart. I was doing it so much different than women in my my family, my ancestral women. But no, suddenly I was I was really um, faced with these difficult decisions. What am I going to do? See my children or see them less because I wanted to do something else, pursue a career. So it was hard. And I had my consulting business um, in the very beginning of my motherhood, but then, you know, calculating hydrocarbon saturation did not make any sense to me. And I felt like I'm failing as a mom and I'm failing as a petrophysicist because that was my job title. I was a petrophysicist consultant. And I realized that I need to do something else because this just doesn't work for me. And it wasn't that easy that, okay, I figured, okay, it doesn't work for me. I'm going to do something. (laughs) Yeah, there was rock bottom in between. (laughs) 
<laughs> and as you mentioned, Kim, the years of personal healing and really facing my shadows brought me to the point where I am right now. Interesting. So talk to us a little bit in terms of your own healing. How did you reconcile that? And, and the reason I ask, let me back up a little as some people don't realize, you know, the very early stages of Rethink You, my business, my original uh, program was called The Third Alternative because I wrote it back in the late 80s, early 90s. And at the time, there was this huge culture war about whether it was right to be a stay-at-home mom or to be a career woman. And they would like, throw arrows at each other. And I said, you know, the third alternative is to do what's right for you because everybody needs to determine their own life journey. So you having dealt with that struggle reminds me of just how it may still be an issue for many women. And um, this is just wonderful, but talk to us about how you went through your own healing. You know, what did you do to reconcile that for yourself, Aga? To answer this question, I may just back up just a little bit to tell you where I was at the time where my rock bottom, you know, uh, <laughs> that was actually quite, a, that, was, that was a hard time of my life where I was a stepmom of two school age kids and a mom of two young kids. Wow. I didn't get get sleep for many years now because I had a second daughter and somehow, you know, throughout these years, my second daughter was born when my first, my oldest was two and a half, less than two and a oh half. Goodness. So I, um, but you know, I was kind of running out of time, so I couldn't wait longer. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, I didn't get any sleep for a number of years. And I noticed that this kind of expectation that I put upon myself as a type A woman, career woman, successful woman, I put it upon myself that, you know, everyone has to be fed gourmet food every day, freshly cooked, empty laundry baskets. And yet, you know, I had my consulting business on the side and then I stopped, but still, you know, there was always so much that I felt, I found myself resentful, bitter, and definitely not a person that I wanted to be. And I, the, you know, that was ironic because everything I did to exhaust myself was because I loved my family. But I don't think my, that my children and stepchildren and my husband could even see any love in it, you know, because I was so resentful and exhausted, frankly. So what I started to do, I went to uh, therapy because I decided I need to do something. I can't live like that. And my therapist smartly sent me to she said, just schedule something for yourself, just some time, whatever it is, acupuncture or facial. And I went right in and I scheduled <laughs> weekly acupuncture and monthly facial. I bought Excellent. all kinds of memberships. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's kind of, it sounds superficial, but it brought me slowly into the tracks of being away and thinking for myself. Who am yes. I? My kids were still little when this happened. My older was maybe three and my younger was, you know, six months old or so. But this helps me really kind of being away and thinking as my own person, getting used to the fact that, yeah, actually a lot of things changed in my life, but still I am an independent person and I have certain values, which I want to live. And now even more just to, you know, walk my talk for my children. <laughs> right. Right. So that's how it started. That's excellent because, again, you know, so many times I say to people, who you, you know, who you are is not what you do. So we fulfill yes. different roles, but it's not who we are. And those self-imposed standards of perfection come from misguided expectations. As you said, people end up not seeing it with love. They see it with resentment because you're actually hating what you're doing. Just yes. some powerful things that have come out of that. So yeah. I also wanted you to factor in, when did you actually move to the States? You know, because besides the fact that I'm jealous that you had a facial every month, um, what caused you and your family to then relocate and how did that work for you? Because I know just how difficult immigration was. Oh, gosh, Kim, thanks for asking. This was kind of crazy because, you know, when at the time I met my husband, which is a story for another podcast, because that's the best love story ever. But when I met my husband, I was I had a consulting job in The Hague, in the Netherlands, 
that was about six country I lived in at the time. You know, I bought an apartment. I was very happy. And then I met my husband. And six months after we met, he moved from Seattle to the Netherlands so that we can live together. But, you know, he had to travel quite a lot because of his sons. He had their shared custody. So he wanted to make sure to spend enough time with his children. Mm-hmm. Or the children would fly over to us for some holidays and breaks. Um, but when we decided to have a family, we decided to be closer to the boys so that, you know, we can raise the children together so yes. they know each other and they can bond. And Got I, it. So I moved pregnant, Kim. So I basically <gasps> left my career. I remember, I remember <laughs> crying in an airplane, you know, sitting with my pregnant belly, six months pregnant, you know. Wow. And wondering what what have I done? I just left my amazing career. I you know put my my apartment for sale, and I'm on this airplane to you know first become a stepmother in a country I don't know. And actually, that was all a huge cultural shock for me wow. because you know I'm an Eastern European. Eastern as Eastern Europeans, we're quite harsh mm-hmm. <laughs> in our expression. To say the least, we don't smile much. <laughs> and living in the Netherlands where people are in different kind harsh, not less than, than Poles, I moved to Seattle where everyone is pleasant. I didn't know the small talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's very difficult to make that shift. I think it's easier to go the other way, to go from soft to hard. But there's definitely the soft, friendly, let's love on each other approach. That's that's really interesting. And, you know, for those who are not that in touch with immigrants, ask any immigrant and they will tell you some hilarious stories of adjusting to the U.S. culture. But I can only imagine having to do it pregnant and with two stepsons. So, oh, my goodness. Okay, that's. And is your family still in Poland? Did you have to leave them all behind? Well, I left my family in 1998. That when you went to the Netherlands? I went to Germany. Mm. That, oh, you that went to Germany. So okay. I lived in many countries between, you know, including mm-hmm. Middle East, because, you know, I studied in Germany. I got a scholarship and I lived in other countries. And then right. I felt like Netherlands was the nice place. I just came back from, from Turkey and I thought, oh, my gosh, I could live here in Netherlands. Very nice. <laughs> That's why I bought an apartment. Yes. And so, got it. So, okay. So by the time I moved to America, I was kind of used to being an immigrant, being an expat, you know? Yes. But there's something different about America uh, because, you know, I wasn't surrounded. Like, for instance, right now, in let's say you start, we work in, in, at Amazon, uh, you know, in, in you in your 20s. So you're basically, basically like in an international college. Right. You have people from all over the world. But suddenly I was in the middle of this kind of like... Um, urban American culture. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and there was nothing international about it. <laughs> right. And I must admit, you're the, the first petrophysicist I've ever met. So that's fascinating. Right? <laughs> My pleasure, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> so did, did you actually quit doing that completely when you arrived here in the States? You know, what did, did you change careers after your child? You know, let's get back to your story and say after you had your first child, did you go back to work? Or did you keep consulting? You know, talk us yes. through that chapter. Yeah, yeah. Because you know what happened is I, I quit my career, my, my job, but I had quite good references and connections mm-hmm. still in that in, in that industry. And um, the, back then there were not so many petrophysicists and they were very much, you know, um, looked for and wanted. So uh as soon as I was ready, I started my consulting and I had many projects. I had quite successful consulting business. I had had to hire a nanny, et cetera, et cetera. So right. kind of, you know, but you see, there's a paradox again, Kim, because I was hoping, okay, I'm a consultant. I, am, I have my own business. so I can decide. However, in this industry, it's almost impossible because, you know, uh, I can't plan to work four hours a day but it may not work because if the client tells you that they want to drill the well tomorrow instead of in three weeks, right. suddenly you have to make 30 hours days, you know, <laughs> which was impossible for me as a mom of 10 months old, you know? Right. 
Right. Yeah, even consulting brings its demands. But I think that, you know, based on that international sort of background of yours, um, Aga, you must have some very interesting life lessons. So let's sort of dig into some of the things that you learned along the way that you now pass on in your groups that you're doing. And I want to unpack more in terms of what work you're doing now with other mothers. But let's start with your life lessons. My life lessons I would say the first one is that we are connected. Yes. And that people can change. People change. There's neuroplasticity in which I firmly believe and I'm very grateful for. And, you know, the material that connects us in, uh, you know, as in a shared humanity is compassion. And this is, this is a big deal for me because the way I grew up, You know, I grew up in Catholic religion, so there was some abstract idea of compassion, but somehow in our Western culture and Christian culture, often there is no self-compassion. So that definitely this, that was, that was huge for me, a breakthrough that realizing that. Yes. The concept of, of self-compassion, I think a lot of people struggle with that. I'm pleased that you drew that out because, you know, it's the, the um, metaphor that so many of us coaches use, you know, put on your own oxygen mask first. And yet people don't do that. They agree and they will nod and say, yes, yes, but they don't do it. Yeah, I know. That's right. That's right. And in fact, compassion and self-compassion, which are very closely connected, is you know, this is one of the most important pillars of my business. Right. Because moms, especially, you know, we have this, you know, the patriarchal culture makes us face these hard choices. Do I see my baby or do I not see my baby, but don't waste my career that I had before? Those are very hard choices. And the expectations that we put upon ourselves are unrealistic, frankly. So that's why I think for moms, especially, compassion is so important. Very true. And also the fact that we're all connected. So, you know, I gather from your life lesson breakdown um, that that connection is so important because being in connectedness with others also is a form of self-care. Yes. Yes, it is. But you see, the connection that I mean, my lesson of connection comes from maybe a slightly different place, but it doesn't dismiss what you just said. It is oh, that's true. fine. Mm-hmm. Here's the thing. I grew up in Poland. Poland was a communist country when I was a kid and there was a lot of shaming and guilt trips and, you know, harsh language where I grew up, you know? So I thought this is normal. The harsh language was very normalized for me. To this extent that I was able to say something really unpleasant about pretty much anyone because that's how I grew up and that's what I thought was just normal and I didn't even mean it so much. And at some point, my colleague kind of pointed it out to me. That was this kind of moment of, you know, light bulb light going bulb. in my head. That, oh my gosh, you just said that. What do you say about me when I'm not around? Because I was able to just throw daggers of words, you know. And, and then I realized, oh my gosh. And I first started blaming my culture, my, you know, my family, where I'm from, my, you know, um, really my environment where I grew up, that I'm this way. And that was, you know, and that was until I became a mother and first stepmother. So I started realizing how much power we hold as parents because in, we are power figures for the kids, you know, if we want it or not. So we have to use this power wisely. So our words can hurt. I, you know, we, we really want to watch out for how we show up to our kids and also ask myself, do I want my kids to relate to the world this way as I learned as a kid? And when I started working on it, it also coincided with me discovering mindfulness and compassion. And I realized that actually the, con- the connection here is this, my ancestors, they have been through so much. They just couldn't do it differently, you know? So I discovered how important it is to really relate to it compassionately right 
because we're all connected. So, you know, my actions are not just my, purely my responsibilities, not to, to you know, seek excuses, but I'm a cause and effect of everyone else who shaped my life, my, you know, my ancestors, my community, my school, et cetera, et cetera. So we all connected in that way. So we, if someone struggles, it's not this person's problem. It's, it's problem of all of us. Right. If that person behaves the way they will regret, <laughs> it's also not only this person's problem, it's everything that shaped this person. Hi there. It's Kim, and I wanted to just stop by and say I hope that you're enjoying this episode. If you are, please be sure to like, review, and subscribe, whether you're on a podcast feed or the YouTube channel. As you know, putting out media takes time and effort, and we live for subscribers and reviews. So if you think this is a great podcast, please tell the world about us and be sure to subscribe. Thank you. Now let's get back to today's interview. Absolutely. And I think that's an interesting insight that you mentioned about how we are normalized about things from our early upbringing and from our ancestors. And that's not necessarily an excuse. I see it as a starting point because like you, I wholeheartedly support the practice of neuroplasticity. That's at the cornerstone of my coaching. And the fact that you can teach your brain new patterns, but at the same time, show yourself enough compassion to understand where that normalized behavior came from, see the effects and say, I have the power to change the course. I don't have to stay that way. Yes. Wow. That's powerful. And, you know, so tell me, you know, obviously the dream was to help teach other women what you had learned. So let me stop talking. You just got me excited. So um, I don't normally talk this much. Tell us more about what you're doing in small groups, you know, what is this dream that you're working on right now? So uh, this is where I get excited, Kim. <laughs> yes, we're done with all the past. Let's talk about what you're doing now. <laughs> yeah, you know, and the only thing I want to mention from my past is when I struggled as a mom, because of course I had to face my shadows. I sometimes reacted to my children not the way I wanted. I made choices that I'm not proud of, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I thought I'm extremely alone in it. So this alienation was profound. And then I started noticing that it's not just me, but no one talks about it in this culture somehow. And so I want to, so my, my mission is to connect people over the struggles, but not just to commiserate with each other, but to find the power. Because here's the thing, as moms, we talked, Kim, how, right, you can relate to this, how we can you know, uh, have this huge expe- expectations of ourselves as moms, right? So we end up exhausting ourselves. And, you know, we, and, and we have all <laughs> right to feel miserable and despise it because that's not the way to live. But there's the other way to look at this. You can look at this, oh my gosh, I manage so much. I'm a powerhouse. Right. So basically what I do in groups, we connect over what our experiences are and we kind of normalize them. It's freaking hard to be a mom, to be a modern mom. We have choices. And being able to align these choices with your own soul and values with all the noise from the outside is hard. But connecting through this, you know, through this misery and finding empowerment in it, like empower each other, how amazing we all are with what we can achieve you know because we already have gone through so much what potential we have that's powerful that's powerful and helping each other get there because as you said it's easy to get into the commiseration and the shame and the guilt and thinking there's something wrong with you but there's also power that's been found in that community to realize you're not alone yes and that you have that power to, uh, to surpass it. That's, that's incredible. But I know too, that somewhere in the journey, you probably had your own moments of getting lost. You know, sometimes we get too deep in the forest to see the trees and uh, (laughs) what lessons could you pass on in terms of perhaps mothers specifically getting a little lost in this whole process saying, I can't find myself. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing. What would you advice would you give those kinds of moms? I give quite a practical advice because as moms, we have 
a lot of to-do lists, either on paper, in our phones, or somewhere, you know, floating in our mind. So I give a, uh, an advice, which is called flip your list. And this is all about all these things that are on the bottom of the list that you do for yourself, that, you, you know, like pick up this painting or cycling or, you know, running or whatever you're dreaming of that are purely about you, but you will do it, you know, on your list only when everything is as is done. The problem with this list is that not, that, that you never get them absolutely completely done. So the flip your list exercise is to put one of these things, just one, let's say reading for five minutes a day on top of your list and just do it first. You know, either first in the, first thing in the morning or maybe wake up especially to do it first thing in the morning. Or let's say you have some unstructured time. So you could do some dishes, or other chores, answer emails or do some work. Just do the reading first. So that's the flip your list. Do your thing that you always want to do, but you feel like there's never time for it. And the other thing is that be flexible and hold it easy because, you know, and hold it loosely because it's hard to have everything perfect. You know, the three hours without children, there's nothing else to do, etc., etc. So just take the five minutes and do the best out of them. That is some fantastic advice. Flip your list. I love it. I love it. Because I think it's so true, even for those of us who are not actively raising children, the things that we truly want to and dream about tend to be at the bottom of the list. And all the have to's and must do's and should do's and need to's come above it. That's really good. Flip your list. I love that. That's a keeper. Isn't that amazing? While you were saying that, Kim, like all this stuff on our list, sometimes it's completely irrelevant because we kind of think we have to do them, the shoulds, right? Yes. But actually, we don't even have to do them. <laughs> we no. <can> get deeper. <laughs> exactly. I, uh, I, I, years ago, I heard a speaker say, you know, kick the should right out of it. Um, you know, and I also train people on disempowering language not to say should to, or should do, or have to, or need to. All of those are disempowering. But I just love that statement flip your list. I think that if people remember nothing else from this interview, I hope they put that one in the pockets because you can get a lot from that. But um, sorry, I'm meandering all over the place. You're fascinating to listen to, Aga. Thank you so much. <laughs> but what, what else do you share with women? Tell us, you know, I'm not going to ask you to give away the shop here, but what else do you help people encourage to do that is easy to get them out of that place of resentment mm. and, and exhaustion? Because the reality is it's exhausting. Generally, my mission, Kim, is for moms that I work with, and generally for all moms, truly, to help them find their power. Mm -hmm. Because power in our culture is something that women are quite reluctant to reach for. So this is, some, this is a mission of mine to really, first of all, help women determine what is it, how, what is my own definition of power, and how they want to live it, how they want this to manifest for me in my life so that's how that's basically the the foundation and you know I transition from I right now I'm slowly transition to the group coaching just because I love the community I love how women connect with each other and you know find the shared humanity that's very that intensifies the work that we do together and right now I have a program called the liberated mother it's it's running right now and it has six months, six modules. So what I like doing, I like making these programs to help women to dig as deep as they want. It can be quite intense in your personal development, but it doesn't take much time because all that we do is not to kind of add, okay, this is something else I should do. So there are no shoulds, but it's kind of a shift, creating a shift on how can you live your life manifest your values in your daily activities so that you, um, you know, you, you do it the way that feels, makes you feel most, most alive. You know, so it's not adding, but just shifting how you do things. And a big part of it is this kind of sensual empowerment, allowing yourself for pleasure, prioritizing your pleasure. You know, the pleasure is having a cup of tea without rush. And it's also sensual pleasure, you know, physical pleasure. 
you know, moms and pleasure is almost a taboo. So this is one of my modules because I really wanna encourage moms to also, you know, enhance the, their power by being able to access the ways they can experience pleasure. No, keep I'm going. To talk I love it. No, keep going. I'm loving it because I'm going to ask you in a moment how people can connect to, with you and find out about these programs. But tell us what else is included in this because I love that just finding the moments of sensual pleasure. Because yes. again, it's something that falls off the table because people feel they don't have time for it or they don't have right. the right to have it. Right, and many moms are also in a you know in a relationship. So you know, of course, like each relationship after having children has some kind of like intimacy crisis. They're yes. rare. It's rare that people don't go through it. It's more often, right, that, that relationships experience this crisis. And, and often women make their own pleasure dependent on their, you know, intimacy situation, but it doesn't have to depend on that, you know. And we can allow ourselves to explore what we like what actually, you know, fuels us, makes us feel alive. Yes. And if we talk about sensual pleasure, sexual pleasure even, right, some relaxation and being present is really important. So I right. teach women how to be instead of, you know, being having this doing mode all the time, you know, that yes. I should be doing, I should complete all the tasks and then I can sit down. But then either you're exhausted <laughs> Oh, this moment never even comes, right? So the flipping right. list comes handy. That's the first baby step. But then, so, well, the program is six months long and each month is a different module. We only meet once uh, and it's via Zoom for 75 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there is, we have a community on Voxer that we share with each other. Usually women can share with each other or access my help and support through Voxer. And... They are journaling prompts and some very, um, you know, carefully curated resources right. for each month. Right. And how many women do you take through the program at one time? I mean, how many are in the group? Did you hear me? Yes, now you're back. So, oh, okay. I was saying, how many women do you normally take through in the group? You know, I uh, like having small groups because I like, you know, I really care that the people in a group um, connect with each other. So currently I have six people in a group, but right. I'm thinking that in my next session will expand to 10 right. because I think it's still going to be a nice space, very intimate and yet very diverse with different experiences, different stages of motherhood. And I want to mention one more project that I'm working on that i I already uh, ran once before. It's called Parents Liberation Project. It's a parenting class for parents, also for, for dads uh, or any caregivers really. But that parenting class doesn't focus on how to parent in terms of like, you know, if your child does this, then you do this. But it focuses on parents and how we show up to our children, how we um, you know, how our ego shows up in our relationships with our children, how we, our fears, our, you know, past trauma show up in the, in the relationships to be aware of, of them and really, you know, um, set yourself free as a parent and let your children fly, you know, and be seen and, and accepted. So oh, this starts fabulous. in September again, five okay. sessions. That's it. But uh, I love that program. That's fabulous. And again, how many couples do you take? Like six or eight or how many do you have? I have also, I have, uh, I have uh, 12 spaces in this program and okay. no, don't necessarily have to be couples. You know, people can just join whatever configuration they want. And there are just five sessions every other week. Um, Got it. Yeah, so I have an evening session and a morning session for whoever prefers, you can choose an option. And it's really amazing also to work through these things in a group because, you know, yourself perhaps, Kim, there's so much shame attached to parenting, to how we all feel kind of inadequate as parents, incompetent as parents at times. And this is very cathartic to be in a group, work through this material and realize that you're not alone with all of these. <laughs> right. 
Right. I think it's powerful because, you, you know, what you just said there too about parents, you know, we bring the narrative of our parents with us. We bring our upbringing with us. And it's like, you've got to break the cycle of the sins of the fathers, you know, and be able to have the mindfulness and the, the self-awareness to recognize it when you are bringing forth those dysfunctional patterns. And then how do you shift them to give your children a different narrative that's powerful that's important yes. work wow well i'm almost afraid to say what else because that's plenty you know the um <laughs> the liberated mother and the the um, parents liberation project i mean i just love this and i love that you set people free from dysfunctional patterns and, and wrong thinking but anything else that you're excited about Aga, that you'd like to share with us you know i am um... I am excited about, about those things because I keep this, those things I run for parents and for moms, they keep me continuously inspired. So right. um, I'm a mom as well. So my goal is not to work too much. <laughs> uh -huh. So you see, so my, my goal is to be with my children and be present. So I'm trying to walk my talk here too, because presence is also one of the important uh, pillars of my business. Yes. You know, being present and teaching people to be present to their lives. So, um, yeah, so, so that's it. So I have these two programs, which I'm very excited about. That's fabulous. And, uh, <laughs> and that's plenty. In fact, I'm, I'm really, as I say, I'm feeling satisfied and full and very grateful for all that work. Yes. Oh, it's powerful work. And I think it's game changing. And as you said, to balance being a children. So I guess you've long s since got over being a petrophysicist, right? You've let that one go. <laughs> yeah, but you know, Kim, thanks for asking, because really, that's also, I want to say that it wasn't easy, because how cool does it sound? I'm a petrophysicist, right? Right. Right. My ego didn't want to let go, uh, let go of yes. it. Yes. Plus, you know, I have all this connection in the industry. You know, I have a lot of petrophysicist colleagues and other colleagues in, in the oil and gas industry. So, you know, the, the, the FOMO is real. Right, right. But right now I feel totally complete. And I feel that the work that I'm doing right now just really doesn't leave space for FOMO about petrophysics. <laughs> no, that's great. But I think in many cases, perhaps the constructs and the context of that study, you know, the, the, the chemistry behind petrophysicists actually is a great metaphor for the relationships and the releasing of shame, et cetera. So I could see how you could use it as a powerful source of, of metaphor or analogy in your teaching. Right. Right. Um, Thank you. So I'm taking you down. I'm, I'm not here to tell you how to run your business. <laughs> These but ideas. I love that. These ideas just come to me. I'm like, yeah, well, you're probably very smart about chemicals and people are just chemical reactions with each other, right? Um, but, you know, what, as you've gone through this process of following your dream, Aga, what gifts and talents have you seen within yourself that you feel that this has brought to the surface that perhaps you weren't aware of before? Mm, mostly this kind of, I, I'm passionate about making difference in people's life. And I saw it in a small way. For instance, when I worked as a petrophysicist, I loved, like, if I figured something out, you know, explaining it to someone, sharing it so that their life is easier as well, like, you know, some team members, etc. I love that moment. Like, I could bring some, make some difference in someone's life. And right now, this really is fuel of my business, you know, this kind of um, energy and kick that I get from, making a difference in people's lives. And also, you know, I am a very socially brave person. I'm rather, I'm introverted, recently discovered introvert, introvert but I am socially brave. So that means I am not really very, you know, shy to say things to people, to introduce myself, etc. And in this, while running my business, I realized that actually this I haven't really known that about myself before, that this is a true a skill to get connected with many people. So I have a lot of connections since I started my business, which was not so long ago. That was 2018 when I started the process. But I've made so many amazing connections in the process that really um, helped my business and me to grow personally, you know. 
And the third thing I want to say is this. I don't even know how to categorize it. I'm not sure if you heard about my show, what that was called, initially was called, called Moms Who Dare, but then the name got changed to Interviews with Badass Moms. Oh, right. Yes. I <laughs> love it. So I interviewed 20 badass moms. Uh, Kim, and I see, you for, I, I see you as a great candidate if you would, you know, agree to join me for the second season. <laughs> I just finished the season to. one. And here's the thing. What I learned is that resilience and compassion are much more connected than I thought. So here's my resilience. You see, I'm, I speak English as a second language, not even second, in fact. Um, and I started these interviews with badass moms, you know, and I'm on a video. I was freaked out. I didn't want to start it. But without compassion, I wouldn't be able to do it because suddenly I was, I said to myself, listen, you're always going to speak with an accent. You might be socially weird anyway, because you're in a foreign country, you know, you're from a different culture. So you may as well start now. (laughs) Exactly. And I was planning and planning and waiting for, you know, the perfectionism, right? Waiting for for myself to be ready. And, you know, you're never going to be ready. (laughs) Yes. So finally, bam, I started in October last year and interviewed these 20 amazing people and oh, yeah, fabulous. and discovered that resilience with compassion yes. is so much more powerful, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is because resilience requires compassion. I don't think you could be resilient without it. Right. That's a very important observation. And it's interesting you say that because I know I quoted this in a recent episode, but I'll quote it again, is that I heard a saying, which is so powerful and it plays in here about how you started these interviews with badass moms. And I love that. Uh-huh. Um, and the saying goes, you know, massive, imperf- massive imperfect action is better than perfect inaction. Yes. It's like just start doing it. And the same as you, I mean, I started this podcast in 2016 and, you know, I did maybe eight or 10 episodes and then I just let it go because I never made the effort. And somebody said to me last year in 2020, you should start doing that again. And I'm like, yeah, you know, they're right. And I started it and now I realize it's the highlight of my week every week because I've met the most amazing people and I love doing these interviews. So like you, I just love helping people and, and bringing podcasts with diverse but interesting topics that people can learn from just gives me such pleasure so thank you yes. you've brought so much to this discussion thank you thank you um and what i like to ask as we round out because i realize we're almost out of time we've i've lost track of the clock here i was so engaged in your conversation as we kind of come to the close here i go if people had to like turn off the episode I know you've given us some great nuggets that they can hold on to, but is there any more one or two that you'd like them to remember about you as they get on with their lives? About me? Yeah, like about this interview. It's like I listened to this amazing woman, Aga, and she said, what would you hope they remembered? Yeah, that, you know, that you, that, that you worth, that, you know, you worthy, no yes. matter what. And, you know, the compassion element is very important here. So if someone listens to it and leaves curious about how to practice compassion, how to be more compassionate towards themselves, this is going to be an amazing win for me. That's great. And we'll make sure that in the show notes, we have how people can connect with you. They can email you or or register for some of these great programs, either to be interviewed if you think you're a badass mom, reach out to Aga, let her interview you on her next round, or at least consider engaging in the Liberated Mother or the Parents Liberation Project, just some great ways to connect. Uh, But Aga, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for your time today. And anything else that you want to say that you wish I'd asked before we close out? I am just very grateful for you to inviting me and spending this time with you chatting, Kim. I would love to get to know you better. Oh, I'm sure we'll stay friends. I think we have a lot of great connection (laughs) points. So thank you, Aga. And to my listeners, that's a wrap for now. And we'll see you next week. (laughs) 